So which one of these are you? Hello. Well, they're all so different. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Right. Well, I'm Claire Hedine, and I just want to share some thinking that I've been doing for quite a long time about issues to do with how we can best effect uh, positive change. And one of the things that I've noticed is that it works best when we see ourselves as part of that change and try to steer away from pointing at other people and saying, oh, if only they would do this different or that different or they're getting it wrong. There's something about that that seems to create more of an alienation than a solution. Um, and my interest is in, in our own spiritual consciousness of our evolution from that perspective. So for me, the idea is if we can tie those two elements together, then you kind of end up with a win-win. So I've created some slides to kind of help keep me on track, otherwise I could sort of go off at tangents, which isn't such a bad thing either. But um, can, you, you, can you see those right? Yeah. So let's see what I've got first. Right, so one of the most interesting things or exciting things that I've come across is that feeling where you realise, just literally from within yourself, that there's something actually kind of big happening, both in you and perhaps even in your environment around you. And I think just to even begin to notice when that's happening is a really good thing to be able to pay attention to because it brings your focus in and you can start really listening in a way that's not just about your ears, but it's about your body, body, how it listens, and how it can start to filter the stuff that's going on around you, because we're, we're sort of operating in a very mixed energy field. Like each of us is generating energy, um, emotional energy, mental energy, physical energy, various kinds of things, psychic energy. And that's quite a mess, you know, of people all doing that in different ways. And the less conscious we are of, of how we're doing that, I think the more murky it gets, and then the distinction between what's mine and what's yours starts to dissolve, really. Which is okay if it's a good feeling, but if it's not, then, um, then it's really nice to know how to deal with that. Um, and then the other part of this is, I've been thinking about the concept of intelligence. I, I'm a big fan of it, but I think there's a lot more to it than we're typically taught in our formal education. So in the typical formal educational system, you've probably come across it yourselves, rational intelligence is sort of the top of the, the tree. And then everything else is the stuff that you notice that gets cut away in, in funding cuts. So the arts, uh, the body, and the intuition. So all the stuff is actually probably more important Rational intelligence is, is, is a crucial aspect of who we are, but it has its place and it needs to be used specifically for certain kinds of things and not to be mistaken for the best tool for decision making or for life path choices. So given that this was actually called Big Ideas, I thought I'd have fun with that. And I have some quite negative associations these days with the idea of global community because I've sort of seen disenfranchisement, pollution, and uh, a lack of connection. So I thought we'd go for the whole deal and just call it cosmic community. And within that, we're including every species that's alive, everything that lives, shits, and dies, qualifies in the cosmic community. And we're just, just holding for this sort of 40 minutes or so, what the idea is about community, like the qualities that bring us forth, like what is it really that's calling us to come into community. Because I think it's more than just meeting our basic needs, although that's a really good impetus at the moment, isn't it? Because of the way power is shifting and the idea of power is becoming really intangible. Like it looks really evident that power is related to money, but I think that's, that's just one layer of the cake. So there's this uh, empathy, teleology, just very simply, is this idea that there's something beyond us calling us forth. So this part of us that's our sort of collective intelligence, which I'll go into in a sec, is actually knows something for us because we're already part of that future. 
So it's sort of us pulling ourselves forward to something. That's, that's what I mean by teleology. And inspiration is simply when we know that that's happening. It's that kind of aha moment. It's when our body lights up, when we feel like something big is happening. Uh, oh, and obviously part of that is communication. So communication is a lot more than just simply the words. So like right now I'm standing here and you can hear words coming out of my mouth. But I'm also generating some energy and there is something that's drawn you to come and sit in these chairs right now. Maybe it'll draw you to go and leave right now, you know. But there are these gestures of movement that are occurring and we're within that, that field. So our thinking about how to do things and when to do things and what needs to happen is so much more informed than simply looking at data on a page and more than our psychology too. Um, so one of the things that I think would be really helpful for groups, like groups that are trying to create positive change, is to learn about listening, to learn about how listening is actually a much more integrated process than just listening to another person's words as they speak. So when you listen with your heart, when you listen with your body, you become the environment and you're no longer distinct from it. And once you are an environment, then it's very hard to do yourself harm or to make choices that would do the environment harm. So there's something about finding our place, which is what I think of when I think of deep ecology. Like having a knowledge, like a really deep knowledge of who we are, that doesn't have to be based in intellect, but it can be helped by some of it. Um, yeah, so how I listen will influence who I meet. Like if one of you starts talking to me and I keep thinking about what I want to say next, then I'm only listening out of courtesy and not even a very good level of courtesy. But if you started talking to me and I really stopped thinking and put you as the center of what's happening right now, that will bring forth a different experience of you and also a different experience for me. And in that is where we start touching on this idea of dynamic emergence. Like when we're really, really present and we put aside what we think we know needs to happen, then something new can emerge that can really surprise us. And I think that novelty is what we probably need to be listening for as we start this more rapid period of evolution. Uh, and that also, again, comes into this idea of, uh, am I in opposition to you or am I creating something with you? And sometimes we think we're one and we might be the other. So if you find an impatience in yourself when you're listening to somebody, then it might be that you're just like waiting again for your chance. And there's room for all of us. So there's, although there's a rush in some senses because of the effects of pollution and the cause of climate change and social injustices, the only way I think to create sustainable change is for, for the evolution to include all of us and all of me within all of us, all of you within all of us. So like not trying to cut out the bad bits, but actually trying to accommodate them, trying to hear them and see what that's all about. Uh, so that's how I define listening, the willingness to be present for all that is occurring. So it's very different from just data input, brain analyzing, and then me doing something about it, whatever that might be. The willingness to be present for all that is occurring, that's listening. And then hearing is basically the successful completion of listening. So you know that feeling when you've been communicating with someone and they, they just, they still seem frustrated. Or maybe you're feeling frustrated and then one of you just says, yeah, yeah, I know, I've heard you say what I just said, but did you really hear me? And that thing of being, getting a person and being gotten, there's something about that, that when that happens, there's this alchemy that means we're no longer attached to that previous moment and we've become somehow, we've incorporated a change in ourselves because of this honouring that's gone on between us. And it's that simple, basically, just good listening. Um, so the title of this was the dynamic, dynamic Emergence, the Creative Collective. The reason I think it's exciting, this idea of dynamic emergence, is because we are creative. We, we create everything. Like whether it's something that becomes destructive or constructive or 
colourful or, or whatever. It doesn't. The nature of it doesn't really mean much as much as far as the fact that it's just being creative. And I've noticed because for some reason I just find this interesting that when I'm with different people, I feel different. I hear my language change. My vocabulary is different. The things I'm excited by or feel like talking about are different. And that can be within a five minute span. It's not just because I'm in a good mood one day and a bad mood the next day. So when you have a group of people together, the potential, if you've noticed, especially the quality of consciousness of the people, in other words, people that have been paying attention to themselves and not just kind of blindly walking through life, bumping into things and then getting angry at them. That allows for something new to emerge, that creative collective. And I think, as a species, that we have the most enormous capacity, like atomic capacity, for creative, dynamic emergence, for new things to come forth. And I think the only thing in the way is our self-perception. And I don't think it's a big shift to make, to make a really, really exponentially huge difference that is much, much more sustainable. So what's really going on here? Well, I'm kind of talking about that as we go through. Some of these kind of reminders for me. Um, okay, seem to be missing one. Well, I'll, I'll say this. There are typically, like in, in the academic world, people who decided they know everything about how we work say that there are seven main intelligences. And there's probably a slide in there somewhere which I'll come across out of sequence and I'll go, that's them. But basically, they're things like a rational intelligence, our sensory intelligence, like when the body starts saying, oh, you know, when you, the hairs go up on the back of your neck, that kind of thing. Uh, associative intelligence, where I can start to make connections between things, you know, relate one thing to another and think, oh, maybe that could work. If that worked there, then maybe it belongs here. Intuitive intelligence is another one. Um, and then just basic pattern, which is kind of where you just, you notice how things work, you recognize that, you know, the, the brain, everyone thinks that the brain just likes to know how things work. Once it's sorted that out, it can relax. So, but I'm adding a couple, as if seven wasn't enough, because I think these are the two that are missing in, in the sort of greater collective intelligence, in terms of, they're not missing because they are actually there, but they're missing in terms of being accounted for and recognized and taken seriously. And that is uh, ancestral intelligence and nature intelligence. So they, they're probably fairly self-explanatory, but as far as ancestral intelligence goes, if you think about it, even if someone has passed, like died, you can still communicate with them. You can still get advice from them. Even to the extent that if you have an issue with something and you wish you could talk to that particular person, and have you noticed how if you tune into that person, that you start to get the answers that they would have given you. Like you start to think like them. And I think ancestral consciousness obviously can do a lot for us in terms of what we can learn from areas of reality that are not locked in to the dimensions that we're locked into, which have an impact on how we can see things and how we can conceive of moving forward. Uh, and of course, just the element of honor, honoring all the ancestors. And then nature, uh, I've studied music a lot, like the the sort of the metaphysical structures of music as well as the spiritual experience of music. And nature and music have a lot in common. There's all this extraordinary geometric patterning and it's considered sacred geometry and it repeats through the human body also. So everything is very, very, very much like one blueprint on top of the next, on top of the next, on top of the next, and it all syncs up. I mean, it's just incredible, the design of, of our life. So, my sense of things is that nature, from the perspective even just of sound, like everything in nature emits sound, and I have a consideration that that creates a certain form, a certain structure to the world. And so as we start to sort of basically chop out different species, I'm concerned about how that affects the capacity for our infrastructure to hold itself. Because the frequencies create form, they create shapes and forms. And if we're losing big chunks, because everything has a, its own particular range, 
then I just kind of wonder, well, what, what are the consequences of that? You know, like if you have a house and it rests on four legs and you take away one of them, what happens? So that's just a thought, really, that's out there. But I know, and I don't really know how to know it apart from just in my body and intuitively, that our intelligence comes from nature's health and well-being. And I think if you look at intelligent behaviour, it tends to occur where people are in relationship to the natural cycles, and they're not disconnected. So I'd have to do a lot of research if I actually wanted to make that a fact, but it just seems like common sense to me, that our behaviour improves when we're in an environment that supports a more relaxed experience of ourselves, and also one where we belong, we are embedded in. Like if you go to the foot of a very, very, very large mountain, there's an awe that comes up that's indescribable. Um, and I suppose you get the same awe if you look at a very, very tall skyscraper, but it doesn't last very long, you know. It's an awe of, wow, look at that. But there's not necessarily a relationship, it's not necessarily a dialogue going on between you and the building, but between you and the mountain, all sorts of stuff can happen. So, um, if, in case you haven't tried this, when you walk past anything, whether it's simply a plant, or a tree, or a mountain, or a hill, don't wait for sacred sites because it's all sacred and just say hello, pay a compliment, do something to, to activate an interaction and just see what happens, listen, you know. Um, so this, I'm not really going to go into these a whole deal but this is just considering creativity again really more just to think about for ourselves is when do I feel the most creative? When do I feel the most intelligent? When do I have the clearest head? And who am I hanging around? Because that will affect all of those things. And you probably all know at least one person who you love to talk to when you, when you have an idea. And that, there's a reason for that. It's because they can meet you there. They're, they're circulating the same kind of energy. And there are other people who I can, probably put money on this, that you so wish you'd never shared an idea with because they squashed it, they flattened it, they derided it, they doubted it and all of a sudden, you know, what was this sort of spark of excitement and spark of sunshine became like, oh, yeah, I guess that was a stupid idea, you know, and who knows how long it goes on the shelf for until whatever that is in you that got squashed restores itself and then you, you get to bring it out again. So be really mindful of the company you keep including where you work, how you travel, you know, um, just planning ahead, just anything, but just do, doing the things that help keep us um, receptive. So this to me is, is kind of my new discovery, my new insight, so I'm particularly excited about this. And it's consideration of pollution. So, when we think of corporate pollution, that's easy, isn't it? Because we just think of manufacturing and waste products that are toxic. And I've kind of, I came up with an actual definition of it, which was that corporate pollution is when a large body of people serves one ideal that is not holistic in nature. All that means is that it's not mutually reciprocal. So a lot of corporations do that. Obviously not all of them. Corporations doesn't equal evil, but it's easy to think it does. So I've had to remind myself of that at times. Um, but I think where they fall over is when the thinking is so polarized to one e exceptional target that it does not consider its relationship to the rest of the environment, the total environment, not just nature. So. That's how I'm thinking of corporate pollution. But the thing we never talk about is personal pollution. And I think this is a really exciting aspect of reality to consider. And within that, there's our emotional bodies and our mental bodies. So just to help me kind of be clear about this, I decided that emotional pollution in this moment, I could call it that I'm doing emotional pollution when my own personal agenda conscious or otherwise, quite often it's not conscious, poisons my social environment. In other words, thinking about things like the riots in London recently, 
uh, well, and the looting in particular. And then another is alienating co-workers who all believe in a socially just world. So it's very ironic that you could work in, in an organisation that really cares about the environment, but yet it spreads a sort of toxic relationship within the people who work there because they don't really know how to, how to listen, how to respect and honour and do all those things that they want to see happening outside in the world. Um, and then mental pollution is when I'm failing to see the positive that's possible through basically hard work and commitment. So when I somehow give up because of some kind of devolving belief system, in other words, oh, I can't do this, oh, what's the point, it won't work, it won't make a difference, it's too small, I never succeed, like any of that, those kind of mental scripts, that's our own mental pollution. And we, if we have that going on, we're quite likely to be projecting it out as well. Um, and then worse still, I would say, is when I inflict that, which is going on inside me, onto someone else's passions. So just being mindful of that, being supportive, doesn't mean you have to be unrealistic, but there's a way to frame things when you're hearing someone share something they're really excited about, that can actually allow it to evolve into something that you can recognize as having really like sustainable value. So just being patient with the process of whatever's emerging. Again, there we go, Inter integrity, honor, respect. So I feel like I'm reading through the Bible here, but just, these are such basic things. Like I know somebody, for instance, who has such a great vision for a huge planet-based cafe, like something that creates community recognizable all over the world. And he owes a ton on taxes. And there's something in that that, that feels like it's so incongruous. It's like somehow I feel like we need to come clean on ourselves wherever we're hiding something that perhaps we're not proud of. And we don't have to do it all publicly, like in some big display, but somehow become um, more accountable to ourselves so that we're acting with integrity. Because who are we, let's face it, to ask corporations to be um, perfect when we're actually basically doing the same thing, but just on an individual basis and not as a collective. So I think modeling that behavior also would give us a little more patience for the process of change in the larger spectrum. Because if we can model it, that's, that's a full-time job right there. It's certainly not easy. But it just shows, I think it, it starts to create a wave through the whole general energy field. I think it starts to create a wave of change. And I might be completely delusional myself, but I kind of have this feeling that if we work on ourselves, to the extent where we can really look some, someone, even just ourselves, in the mirror and say, yes, I'm completely transparent, that that will influence the whole field of consciousness. That being the case, and here's the part that might be delusional, you think of companies, or I do, like Monsanto or oil companies, people who have this enormous infrastructure throughout the world that currently is doing a lot of harm, but those networks could also equally be doing a lot of good. So just incrementally changing, 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 uh, I guess in my, in my fantasy, it's possible that, that, that what, the damage that they have done, but the way they have done it, could still be turned around, rather than us having to throw everything away and start again from scratch. It could still be turned around and turned into something that could have some value from a long-term sustainable perspective. And then, um, just briefly, this thing about green economics. One of the issues, I teach a class at a university in San Francisco on, um, to business majors, studying, they're studying management. And they, they sort of frighten me because they're about to go out into the world and they don't really know anything to do with the stuff that we've all been studying here and have been studying for most of our lives probably, at some point it began. And they don't really know that there is an independent universe or that there is pollution uh, or you know, unethical practices. So one of the things we explored this summer when I was over there teaching was just reconsidering this idea of growth. Because of course from a business perspective, growth is typically seen as um, profit, like increasing your profit margin, so that's money, and making the shareholders happy. Uh, and the other part of it is just physically getting bigger, so kind of popping up everywhere like a cancer. 
just randomly appearing all over the, the planet. So that's linked to a whole paradigm, which I won't go into in detail, called post-conquest. You know the film Avatar? Has anyone seen Avatar? That's basically a battle between post-conquest and pre-conquest. So pre is, is, is more indigenous type of living, where people are communicating in ways that go beyond just language. Whereas post is, is power over, dominion over, I'm going to eat this and then call it mine. You know, so that to me is growth as a cancer, but then if, if our natural impulse, like a tree, like anything that's alive, is to grow, then there's a point at which that growth needs to be steered in a direction that can still maintain a positive impact. Rather than just saying, well, we should stop growing. If that's not natural to stop growing, then there must be a way that we can use the nature of ourselves as people that grow, or life itself that grows, to some kind of positive effect. So, for instance, if a company uh, starts to make really good profit, we could have an infrastructure that says, at a certain point, we cap that profit, and then excess profit beyond that gets fed back into community. So this, I think there are ways to develop capitalism where you actually do have a cap on the profit margin, and then, then it can become lateral. The growth can become something that benefits everybody. So I just wanted to shove this one in here because this is basically, I think, what it boils down to is a lot of words. But I think the most important thing we can have for ourselves and generate around us is sacred intelligence. And obviously I've got a definition up there that I've sort of decided that feels right for now. But it, it is about an emerging understanding of who we are and of what everything is. So that our lives can become reciprocal with nature, that our emotional balance becomes influenced by nature and that we just understand that we have a really lucky opportunity to be here at all. Like we have breath, we can think, we can sing, we can dance, and yes, we can fight, but I think that's a really low level of communication. It is communication, most definitely, but it's not one that creates something new and so that to me feels kind of unimaginative and not particularly sacred. But when we hold things as sacred, including ourselves, the way we meet everything changes. So I think I'm just going to, I think that's it for now. So that's the general idea. I'm just really looking to find some ideas that will be useful because I see loads of organizations that want to do positive things and I can't work in all of them. But if I can help people see themselves as part of an evolving evolution of consciousness, then that's something I can have an influence on, if it's helpful, um, sort of, that will feed through into everything. So it's a matter of changing our perspective just a tiny bit, or incorporating something into our perspective. So there you go, that's it for now. <laughs>
it's fun for me to hear uh, feedback because sometimes I don't realize how something I've said has been received. <clears throat> So I didn't even realise I'd said it quite like that, but you. Yeah. But well, so it's just, interesting. Yeah, my interpretation yeah this, exactly. Yeah, I just, I just now, wow, that's a really powerful thing to harness with yeah. ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. So spark off a load of other. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, Claire. Just following on from that, from your point, which was a lovely point. Um, <clears throat> it also depends on the way that you perceive nature and right. it strikes me that in order to be able to enter that kind of consciousness that you're talking about we have to somehow surrender our attachment to the human <laughs> um, the dominator sort of anthropocentric dominator paradigm that, that insists that we that we can somehow know nature as a whole entity you know even saying that the planet itself even talking about the planet, we run the risk of talking about it as something separate from ourselves, rather than us actually having to surrender the most fundamental thing, which is our own human perspective, to enter that of a tree or an animal or, right, right. or a planet or anything else. Which is why something like shamanic journeying is so good, or just meditating with a tree. Uh, or just that, like, a meditation be so many things, like just being in the presence of a tree. Yeah. Exactly. saying that you think it sounds like there's a distinction between us, if I use the term planet, that that somehow implies that we're separate from it? Is that... No, not in the way that you're using it. But okay. There's always a danger in that, is that we, even seeing ourselves as kind of, if we, if we say we are, you know, we're a guardian of the planet, there's always, the, there's still that distinction if we're not careful between it myself in saying that and I mean it, it's, it's difficult because we're stuck with the language that we've got no, but, but, there's, but I think there's also something more subtle going on which is that if, if we keep our sort of mind, our humanness as separate from this emerging, dynamic emerging intelligence that you're talking about, yeah. then I think we always run the risk of, of, of doing damage even if we don't mean to. Well I think the, for me the way to avoid that that, that separation is language, actually. So for me, I don't see myself as a guardian of the planet. For me, that feels kind of ridiculous because I actually feel like a child of the planet. So with that automatically comes uh, a need for honour and respect towards that to which I belong. So I think it is important to pay attention to our language. I agree. Yes. But I think that um, the, the reason that we feel, well, I think that Mark's here on the head when, when he talks about alienation, you know, the alienation that people suffer from each other and from, yes. from everything becomes a commodity and, it, and has a use value I know. To, make, to make a profit. To me, the, 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 the fundamental shift is when you move away from an organised system, which, well, basically capitalism, which, which looks at everything as having, a, a, you know, is commodified, you know, fetishized, and it's the, the process of moving away from that ideology. So that ideology is, is so all-pervasive, but people do not realise actually how, like, how much it, it psychologically impacts on people. But, and then straight away you're created a separateness from it through the production process, through the exchange process, and listen, I, I don't, you know, when you were talking about, um, you know, change, I don't think you can change capitalism for, for better. And I, I, don't, and I don't think you can have a limit on growth. Because if you have a limit on growth of capitalism, it's not capitalism. Right, so you it can have to have, be something new. Yeah, that's what yeah. communism really, I mean. Or, well, no, or to anarchist. me that's another extreme. I, I'm, I'm a Libran. I'm all about finding that middle road. I don't, I don't think you can yeah. have a middle road. With, with, I don't think there is a middle road with, with capitalism because the, the dynamic is a dynamic 
you either have it or you don't. I mean, you can't have you can't have something which is only got a little bit of growth or or you know, does, has a profit dynamic. You have to replace that, otherwise it's still the same. If you have a cap on it, it's not capitalism anymore. But what if the, I'm not talking about limiting growth from the perspective of, of profit, although I think that would be nice, but just Profit after a certain point goes off to feed communities. Not feed literally with food, but, but in, in every sense of the word. But then that wouldn't be capitalism. Well, I don't mind it having <laughs> so, a new name. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's me, it's semantic. Yeah, yeah. 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 But, but what I'm really referring to isn't capitalism as such. That's not something I feel qualified to debate about. Because there are so many different systems and there are other people that can do a better, more accurate job of that. But it's just this idea that if growth is a natural phenomenon that we can't stop, then instead of it being allowed to run its course in any direction purely profit-based, then I'm, I'm considering that there, there would be a way to just harness that energy and, and have it go out to do other things. I, I was just going to say one thing before you pass. I, I, I would argue that um, economic growth is a natural and it's a, it's a man-made creation. I mean, growth, economic yeah. growth, and growth in, in the context you're talking about is very different things. And I think economic growth is something which is just the dynamic of what's gone on. Uh -huh. I mean, that, that's that's benefited a very small elite of people to and enable them to have huge power and control over resources and huge amounts of well, whatever society, you know, bringing laws and developing that way. I don't think I think. You can have different types of growth, but I don't think in terms of economic growth, it is, it's not natural. Economics is not natural. They make out that the you know, economic system is a natural occurring thing. It's not. It's an ideology. It's not just one ideology that's put out there. Right. It's a natural occurring thing, and, it, and it's not true. And, you know, and that's that's why you know you have economics as a separate entity, as if it's this big out there, which which has to occur, and it doesn't. You know. But they, because of the, the people who are in power, who it benefits, it benefits them to have that ideology is viewed as a natural occurring system, and growth is this natural thing, and progress comes out of growth, and all that sort of stuff, because it benefits them, not, it's not natural, it's man-made, it's a creation. Okay, so ideology. I'm hearing what you're saying, yeah. you're telling me that you don't think it's natural. No, no, not, not right. economic growth. Right. Yeah. Right. But there's distinctions we make, that's... Yeah. yeah. Okay. Did you want um, to... Yeah, I just wanted to respond to that, really. Um, unless you want to say anything yourself about it. Well, I suppose if I was going to stick to the content of what I've been talking about, the question I would ask you, which I don't really expect you to answer right now, is would you be willing to look at yourself and hear as well as feel the way your response is coming out of you as a possibility for you to know something more about yourself? Because, and I'll tell you why I'm asking is this thing about, and I'm not saying that you're doing blaming, but it takes me onto that track, that line of thought, that when we look at things as if they are outside of us, you know, like John was talking about nature, if we look at nature as if it's outside of us, then we're in trouble, more likely to do damage um, unknowingly as well as knowingly. Um, we run the risk of, of alienating further so although it's important to do an, ana an analysis of how things are working, you know, in terms of economic structure, what I feel drawn to understand better is how each of us comes towards that discussion. Because if there's a lot of anger, then to me, the curiosity is, does it all belong in this subject? And so just weeding out stuff. So at a risk of sounding incredibly corny, like if you were a garden, are you clearing your garden well enough so that when you look outside at everyone else's garden, you could actually give them advice or have empathy or compassion or somehow meet them in a way that you're not now experiencing any turbulence around the thinking. Does that make sense? That was a lot of words. <laughs> But all I'm saying is that we are that which we see. And, and that's a really succinct way to say something that is a sort of a spiritual truth, if you will, that, that arcs back over time. And I think we come to find our way of relating to that individually 
you know, in terms of how do we make sense of that as an idea? I could come back on that. <laughs> you could, but I just, I just want to see those. Did anyone else want to? Can I, can I say? Yeah. Well, there's a lady yeah. in the back. Could you possibly share the mic? I just want to let other people come in. I also want to be mindful of time. Where are we at with time? I actually don't really know what that means in terms of where I went to finish. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I had, a, I had a question. I don't know if it's a question or an observation. It's not really related to that particular point, but um, I was really interested in what you were saying about relationships to where you work and integrity and yeah. about being around people that support your values. And this year, I've seen we've come across loads of clashes with institutions, either a college or a workplace, you know, coming up against different ideologies and having either to clash with that and take myself out of it. And, and I'm a real visionary, I have loads of ideas, and people are always saying, oh, you need to build a team around you, you need to build people. And I just found this, this fear of creating an institution or creating an organisation, when my experience has been recently that they come with a whole messy power dynamics and a whole, I don't know, sound of an institution is quite a, a big thing. So I, I don't know, I'm really... I'm really intrigued because I, I tend to want to go back to the basics and be really personally and you know full of integrity and start something small. And people are like, oh, you know, think big, think big. And I I just sort of have this feeling you have to build it up right from scratch, like being debt free, living where you want, to do working outwards. And yet I don't know. There's a desire for this growth thing. Yeah. So it's a conflict really between building social structures and institutions and businesses, and and then. And at what stage to build, and what stage to sort of pair back and get right. Yeah, start from yourself. Well, the first thing I might suggest is is just consider instead of looking at it as a conflict, because automatically there's like, Ugh. yeah, uh, there is a tension. There's always tension between uh, like when things are growing. Like if you remember when you were little and your bones were stretching, you know, sometimes yeah. your legs would ache horribly. That's a tension. Like there's. Growth is uncomfortable, the, the participation in growth is always a new experience, you know, and as time passes we, we have more reference points to pull from, which helps, and also a more extended community to pull from and get support from, which helps. Um, I personally like your idea of keeping it as small as it needs to be to start, and then allowing it to grow as it needs to. This, this concept that something must grow, you must get bigger, is a very, um, I personally find it to be kind of sick. It, it's a sickness in my sense of reality, which doesn't mean there's anything wrong with growth per se at all, but just to have that as a goal, I don't really understand the point of it, because things are the size they need to be, and they'll grow as they need to, and I think monitoring that growth is very important. And you're right, when you bring a group of people together, it can get really messy, because there is this whole dynamic between the mental and the emotional stuff, where we've got like, all of this of who I am, I'm like, part, you know, you get to see perhaps the tip of the iceberg, then there's all the ice that's actually under the water, but the whole package comes forward, whether I'm willing to acknowledge it or not, and you bump into that, and li likewise in the other direction. So the more people you have, the more of that you've got going on. So it requires a lot of um, attention to what's going on energetically, and, and that's a skill. So, yeah, I, I would just support you in, in following your own instincts. And I think caution is fine as long as it's not being guided by fear. That, that's probably my, my thoughts. It's really interesting. It's maybe made sense a lot of what you're saying. Okay, good. Yeah, because some of this stuff can seem, even to me, like, God, I hope it's not too abstract, but it feels really important. So it feels important to me to keep sharing it, to refine it, to find out what's the real, like, what's the simple little nugget here that I can share with people so that it can be useful and transferable. Because I think that's important too. If something is true, typically I think it, it's more easily transferable as a truth. Um, but I suspect we are now probably at time, so I'm going to, like, hang up the phone here. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Oh, there's a mailing list if anyone wants to stay in touch. <laughs>